Hello, everyone. Thanks for tuning in to COVID-19, The Humanities Respond. I'm joined today by Peter Krop, Professor of Film and Media Studies and an internationally recognized scholar of digital culture and media. Hello, Peter. Thanks for having me. So today we're gonna to talk about computer games spreading a virus. We'll discuss how computer simulations model a pandemic and what that allows us to say about digital culture. So tell us a little bit about a game you're playing and what might that game tell us about our current situation with the pandemic, with contagion, please. I came across a game um, that has been taking off since January of this year. It's called Plague Inc, Plague, Inc. Plague Incorporated, and it's a simulating, um, it's simulating an epidemic. Uh, it's been an increasingly popular download in 2020, uh, became one of the top paid games on the Apple um, App Store, surpassing Minecraft, which is pretty amazing, despite the fact that it's eight years old, which is uh, almost stale in the uh, mobile game industry. It's developed by a UK company uh, about eight years ago, and uh, three years ago it also became a board game. Um, it's one of several games of that type. There's another one called Pandemic 2.5, um, that let you play with uh, viruses or, or bacterial diseases, parasites that are infecting the planet. And, you know, in a maybe slightly morbid way, uh, this has become a very popular category recently. Uh, interestingly, Plague Incorporated, the game that I've been exploring, uh, has also been recently banned from the iOS App Store and from Steam in China. Uh, either in an attempt to mitigate negative press around the spread of COVID-19 or because of the a recent update in the game that allows you to spread not just the virus, but also fake news. And, uh, you know, the fake news mode uh, caught the attention of the censors. At any rate, about 130 million players have downloaded this uh, game Plague Inc. since 2012. Uh, and in the most recent version, it actually lets you save the world instead of infecting everyone. That's really interesting. Uh, you know, I, I'll just say that, um, you know, your comments about the, um, the currency of this, you know, it's, it's obviously a big concern uh, now. And in some of my other conversations with Chris Fan about, with Chris Fan about um, uh, science fiction, and the, um, you know, we were talking about something as old as, you know, the 1970s, the Andromeda Strain, which is a, a, a narrative I was talking with Jonathan Alexander about representations of the, of the AIDS crisis. But it seems to be something that, you know, really periodically comes to the fore again, while being a kind of consistent background of, of concern for, for really a long time. I did want to pick up something, which is that um, between the analogy between playing at spreading fake news and spreading a virus, um, you know, that, that, that clearly kind of relates to media studies and some of the concerns uh, that we have about media. Um, how beyond that is this a topic for, for media studies? Well, media studies um, is you could say the introduction of the questions of technology into the humanities and it shifts the focus from uh, storytelling in older modes, literary modes, or even film. You know, another good example from the 70s uh, matching the Adamata strain is, you know, one of the most expensive Japanese sci-fi films of all times called Virus, Sonny Chiba uh, a film that uh, too few people may be watching right now. There are many examples like that, but gaming uh, and interactive simulations make it just much more palpable and, and tractable. Uh, there are networks of technologies and institutions that allow us as a culture to select and store and process data and manipulate the data on a screen. So this has a long history, of course, from uh, wargaming to computing in the Second World War era trajectories and explosions and then from flight simulators to radar screens to our current uh, immersive graphic user interfaces and control devices such as the ones that we're using right here um, to talk to each other remotely. 
Uh, so there's a, there's a whole history of cultural artifacts and gateways to alternate realities um, that allows us to model things, uh, to try out hypotheticals. So it's not just a realm of science fiction or a fiction. Um, simulation is not just for climate modeling or futurology. Uh, and instead of making that uh, distinction between fiction or science, we can see that out of these technologies, out of these developments, uh, rose whole new entertainment genres, including games, um, but also a, a range of other industries like virtual reality, augmented reality, uh, other new media. Right? So I would say every, every game is a simulation. Not every simulation is a game. Oh, sure. So you're also talking about the way in which technological advances and um, you know, sci scientific paradigms and, and so forth may be affecting culture and actually generate, you know, generating creativity in uh, the cultural sphere. Um, how about in the other direction? And what, what are some of the ways in which, you know, what we would think of as humanistic concerns uh, around meaning or narrative or, um, you know, the thematics of, uh, of culture, how are those shaping the technologies and, and in particular digital, uh, digital culture? So when we, when we teach and when we research the history of media and of technologies, um, we might be using something popular like um, uh, film, television, game culture uh, in order to um, get to the slightly uh, drier and, uh, uh, and more difficult to illustrate uh, ideas about the progress of technology in general. Um, but you know, as I said, you know, it's true that games are not always scientific models, but they draw on how science has been uh, using modeling. There's a lot of scientific uh, endeavors that are difficult or dangerous to do um, without the help of simulations, right? So, you know, we have a nuclear stockpile. We need to test whether that's ready. We need to test whether it's deteriorating in a way that doesn't endanger people. Um, or even the old example of the flight simulator. Uh, flight simulators are really crucial even today uh, to train pilots and keep them up to keep their skills up to date uh, on various flight models. Uh, and you know they're used to teach somebody to fly. Uh, that's a risky and expensive uh, thing. You don't want to uh, crash planes or have pilots fail um, before they become proficient. So you use a simulator. So simulations are a training device, they're a test device, they're, uh, they allow us to explore data sets that make um, uh, kind, all kinds of scientific fields more tractable. Colleagues at UC Berkeley have published a website that offers a mask sim that demonstrates the effect of wearing uh, face masks um, and how they can curb the spread of uh, coronavirus. Um, that comes with a simple four-minute vi tutorial video illustrating. Uh, or there's an epidemiologist in Germany who developed a COVID-19 simulator at covidsim.eu, uh, where certain aspects of the spread and of uh, mitigation measures can be variables. Right? So it lets you, yourself, explore models of social distancing, timing lockdowns, uh, you see how you can enhance or prevent herd immunity or what kind of Im uh, infection peaks you can expect. You extrapolate from certain assumptions and you can sort of uh, evaluate hypotheticals. Uh, you can test your own assumptions. Uh, you can uh, test longer or shorter periods of stricter or less strict social distancing, how many people observe those rules. Right? So, uh, it, it teaches you to question your own assumptions. The humanities need to do that just as much as the hard sciences. And from the humanities, the uh, simulations take all kinds of data displays, uh, visualizations, you know, the advances in computer graphics that we rely on uh, you know, are what makes these things tractable and plausible, not just to specialists, but also to a more general audience. 
And in general, it's still about storytelling, which is the core humanities domain. Uh, these simulations would be incomprehensible. They would not be good communication. They would not be good testing um, if they were just restricted to symbols or, or numbers. So they use a kaleidoscopic range of infographics, of displays, and other ways to convey very complex data. And that's something that the game industry has been pushing uh, further and further and further, not just in terms of graphics, but also in forms of interactive storytelling, of inviting people to explore a complicated data set, a complicated situation, a, a virtual world. So part of what I take that you're, that you're saying is that this world of data it, and, and some of it is directly, you know, out there as, you know, data flows and, and information flows. Others are, you know, complex, uh, you know, multi-sided, uh, large-scale phenomena that can be probably most, uh, most appropriately modeled and, and captured by, by computational processes. We nevertheless, as human beings, have sometimes difficult difficulty in actually just cognitively grasping that and certainly experientially and intuitively grasping it. And the humanities have a whole set of historical, I'm going to use a somewhat anachronistic term, but software, um, you know, software and imagistic software and conceptual software that allows that, that interface to take place and allows us to um, experience and understand that those those very complex worlds of data, whether those are you know models or actually data worlds uh, themselves, but it's uh, also it sounds like you're saying that gaming and simulation and and a kind of play with this is a way of adapting and and, and training oneself into you know, both a set of practices, but also a kind of, you know, computational mindset that allows you to, you know, enter into these spaces and find your way around. Exactly. So these are the newer forms of firing up uh, the, the graphics engine that is your mind, you know, to follow along in your uh, metaphorical uh, trail here. Um, to To engage the imagination, not just with words or storytelling, uh, but also with writing, with graphs, with illustrations, and then with time-based uh, media, with films, with animations. And once you can make that interactive, uh, it, it goes one step further than just uh, a slideshow or a film or a video uh, or a set of instructional um, uh, guidelines to you know, how to use a technology. So it trains us to interact with our uh, multiple different devices and screens. It trains us to explore complicated data sets. Um, nothing, no device that we have come up with is better at chaining together um, multiple decision trees of what if, what if, what if, what if, what if, right? Uh, whether you use that for betting or for um, extrapolating into the near future of weather patterns or of uh, stock market patterns or of uh, employment tendencies, etc. Everything that we ask of ourselves about uh, at the most complex level, we can try to use computers to understand uh, and, and understand it better. Uh, but it doesn't mean that we do away with uh, the traditional way to engage people, especially people who are not domain experts, in how that can be seen, how, how that can be imagined. Right, so um, to go back to the, the idea that sci-fi is a forerunner of this kind of uh, engagement, uh, there's a great example of simulation storytelling. That is the 1973 film World on a Wire, a Welt am Draht by Rainer Werner Fassbinder. It was a low budget, but very high inventive adaptation of an American dystopian sci-fi novel from 1964 called Simulacron 3 by uh, Daniel Galui. Um, it's about a corporation manufacturing a supercomputer that generates and supports a virtual world robust enough for the entities in it to believe themselves to be real. Right? So it's set in an institute for cybernetics and futurology um, that uh, at the time uh, was uh, very futuristic. To us, looks like it's steeped in art history 
uh, in film history entirely in the service of letting us explore this idea of what is artificial intelligence? What are computers going to be if you extrapolate their current development? What can the com human computer interaction be? And how do you how do you maintain the place of the human in the loop? Because it's clear that machines can talk to each other very efficiently, but if it's going to be a technology in the service of humans, in the service of mankind, uh, whether for entertainment or for more serious uh, pursuits, you need to make sure that the interfaces still are uh, communicating at a human scale, that it looks meaningful to us, right? So the humanities bring uh, not just storytelling experience to this, but an interpretive, a hermeneutic competence. You know, how do we understand uh, what makes meaning? How do we ask questions about that meaning, right? Media literacy, computer literacy uh, plays a big role here. So I'm also recalling, um, you know, kind of out of out of film history, I believe in, you know, sometime in the 1970s that there's that film uh, with Robert Redford, uh, Three Days of the Condor, where he's a literature professor where he was at CIA, and his whole job is to read books, figure out if there's anything in the plots of novels, you know, that might be useful for them to think about, you know, kind of the, the work that they that they have to do. In a little bit more of a real life example, after 9-11, the Bush White House uh, consulted with screenwriters and science fiction authors about disaster planning and they took a lot of ridicule and, and, and heat for the you know, apparently frivolous uh, exercise on, on their part. Um, is this any different? There might be a gradual difference in that, you know, screenwriters and science fiction authors are still basically dealing in uh, linear uh, storytelling, whereas uh, interactive storytelling and simulations and games uh, is nonlinear and is more interactive. Uh, but that might be a, a quibble. I, you know, I think the the idea that fiction or stories are trivial is a is an error. You know. Um, I would I would put it this way: What if all of these thought experiments were not only a way to articulate um, often obscured connections between fiction and simulation, between philosophy and science, between storytelling and critical uh, arguments, but also a way to reconcile those hard science cultures of uh, computing and the artistic or humanistic uh, tradition of posing um, um, critical questions? Right, so. It's, it's true that after 9-11, that consulting came in uh, for some ridicule, but I think it's also true that there's some value uh, to collectively imagining uh, solutions and to communicating them, especially in politics. You know, politics has become very heavily suffused with audiovisual media. You know, our, the way that we conduct our political affairs is is heavily mediated through television, through Twitter, through um, all kinds of other channels. And it's not good enough to just point to domain experts who have a lot of experience with preparing for a pandemic, but didn't really get the nation to a state of, of readiness. You know, there was a 2012 study on pandemics by RAND, the think tank. There was a 2015 interview that Ezra Klein did with Bill Gates, who had warned in a TED talk of a pandemic. There was a 2017 exercise uh, by Homeland Security for experts working in the Obama White House preparing for a contagious respiratory disease. Um, the National Security Council heard in 2018 about um, the centenary of the flu epidemic. Uh, and, uh, in 2019, in October, uh, uh, in New York City, there was a tabletop simulation exercise uh, conducted by Johns Hopkins and their Center for Health Security about um, a possible threat to the U.S. by a pandemic. So it's not that that knowledge doesn't exist. The question is really how does this knowledge uh, become comprehensible? How is it communicated to the stakeholders? How do we make decisions based on that knowledge? You know, it's not enough to watch films like Dawn of the Planet of the Apes from 2014 um, to see that viruses are a threat to humans. Um, we can say that's es escapism, that's uh, entertainment, um, 
we need modes of taking this more seriously uh, without being alarmist. And um, simulations do that very well. Simulations allow you to take some responsibility for how these factors come together. Um, and by the way, um, games do that particularly well so that when um, Plague Incorporated, the game that uh, I mentioned earlier, uh, became popular um, for after first uh, being published, the CDC, the Center for um, uh, you know, all kinds of expertise in communicative uh, diseases, um, said they were interested in Plague Incorporated as a, a non-traditional route to raise public awareness on epidemiology, on disease transmission, on pandemic information, uh, because a game can create a compelling word a world that engages the public on serious public health topics, uh, more so than a press release from uh, somebody doing research. So there's a kind of a, let's say, a, you know, a knowledge front, but also what I'll call a meaning front, which may be, um, you know, not requiring the same sort of criteria as knowledge, but, but allow people to get a hold of it and to be motivated and to, to be moved by it. So would you, would, would you say that that's maybe where one of the kind of um, dimensions of the of pandemic simulation has relevance to humanities research? Um, you know, what would you what would you see as kind of the the the, the main points of, of relevance of this to humanities research? Well, one really crucial thing that um, we all say we do and we do do it, but we don't always explain to people in other disciplines what we mean by it is, uh, you know, critical thinking, asking all kinds of questions that explore the assumptions, right? So in, in, in models, in simulations, it's much more explicit than, than in other things that we analyze. Um, one of the main differences in terms of trying to understand what the coronavirus is or does um, is modeled very differently in two very influential studies one that's identified as coming from imperial college london and one that other universities in the uk proposed and uh, the government of the united kingdom was kind of torn between two different models they have access to the same facts, but they make slightly different assumptions, right? So the difference between such models bring out that if you question assumptions, if you don't just uh, consume information as it's presented, but you question uh, how it is presented, and you see, oh, one of these models assumed that only half of the population were going to follow guidance on social distancing. If you assume that three quarters of your population might follow guidance, that makes a huge difference. If you assume that only one quarter of your population that follows uh, political or, or health officials in, in social distance guidance, that makes a huge difference, right? So you, exploring models simulations allows us to make more obvious what humanities scholars and students do all the time, which is question assumptions and to play around with hypotheticals um, that make um, not just stories, um, books, uh, films, um, nonfiction uh, accounts, but also board games, role play, planning simulations, et cetera, uh, the object of, of study, of interpretation. So we need to keep up with models. Um, even models outside of our own core humanities competence and you know, train ourselves in media literacy and in scientific literacy and in hypothetical literacy. I love that, that term of hypothetical uh, literacy. Um, it does actually highlight you know, the, some of the stakes of, uh, of simulation that simulations do matter and actually the the kind of embedded assumptions whether those are um you know epistemic in in nature or you know in more hidden ways ideological or cultural um that 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 these simulations really are you know have have significant stakes and maybe even in some cases life or death uh significance i wonder if you want to talk a little bit about that that sense of of simulation and the, you know, the potential conflicts of, uh, of simulations as well. 
Exactly, exactly. Um, you know, we, in the humanities, we have a long history of uh, philosophical and fictional and other kind of hypothetical exploration of different um, uh, metaphors for uh, communication and for interpretation. Uh, the camera obscura played an important role for uh, Descartes or for Locke. And I think today, um, the epistemic model that a lot of us uh, uh, are, are dealing with is a computer. Uh, but there's a lot of um, misrepresentation, misunderstanding of what the history of computing is and where the history of computing points. Uh, so I would say that simulation is a cultural technique, not just a scientific technique, but a cultural technique. And it shouldn't just be uh, a, something to question the basis of our lived experience. Right? So we, we often hear quoted uh, journalist Neil deGrasse Tyson or uh, philosophers like Nick Bostrom who hyperbolically posit uh, probabilistic uh, phantasm that you know, there's a 50% chance that we already live in a simulated world. Um, that's just a guess that doesn't lend itself to any respectable process of falsification or verification, either in humanities uh, terms or in scientific terms. Um, an even more um, uh, astonishing version of that was uh, when Elon Musk, uh, the entrepreneur, recently asserted that the chance we're not living in a computer simulation is one in billions. <laughs> and if we're not already in a matrix-style world, then the world is about to end. Now, I find a couple of things fascinating with these kinds of pronouncements. Uh, matrix style world, you know, that's an allusion to film. And so the humanities could come in and say, you know, actually, ha have we fully understood what the films, the three films in the Matrix trilogy are about? Um, but, you know, that aside, it's, it's not surprising that some people would rather believe in a simulation than in the world about to end kind of scenario. Um, but this kind of rhetoric that Musk offers or that Bostrom and Tyson offer is very reductionist. Either we will make simulations that we can't tell apart from the real or civilization will cease to exist. You know, that's a very stark choice. Uh, and it, it rests on two assumptions that Musk has to make to arrive at that kind of formulation. One, that the rate of improvement from very simple and primitive graphics, let's say pongs, two rectangles, and, uh, and a dot, to very photorealistic three-dimensional graphics and, and animations that we can immerse ourselves in, can ex be extrapolated much further without any limitations, and it will very soon erase the possibility of telling the difference between reality and simulation. The other assumption is, that no civilization has yet arrived at this kind of inflection point without carrying its own seeds of, of, of destruction to that. I think both of these ideas need to be debated. And in fact, the second one especially has been debated very lively uh, uh, matters in the humanities, in, in science fiction, in film, in uh, speculative storytelling, in all kinds of uh, very serious novels, etc. And the first assumption that we can just simply assume that technological progress will continue exactly as it has in the past, that's also uh, kind of questionable. So from a humanities side, we bring to the study of simulation, not just a look back at the history of these technologies, but also a way to question certain assumptions and to, as you just said, uh, to, to see the implications for um, you know, all kinds of uh, human uh, forms of expression, of communication, etc. So it sounds like you are, um, you know, you're positing or you're 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 um, analyzing a world that is perhaps you know more populated by more kinds of uh, of simulation in more areas, um, but also still holding on to the idea that there's a much more complex interaction between you know, what we might call real world and, and simulation and vice versa, and can be really just captured by either kind of fundamentalism that, you know, you, you played out there. Yeah, these simulations are very real. I don't think they exist on a separate plane. I mean, they're part of how we have organized our social, political, economical, uh, educational systems for ourselves. So, um, 
as we use them, you know, you and I right now, uh, we also need to keep up with our understanding of what it is that we are using instead of just black boxing it and assuming that uh, what we're offered uh, superficially is, is a good enough understanding of it. That's great. Um, are there any other areas of digital culture and our response to the pandemic that you know, you're engaged with now, either in your teaching or your academic uh, research? Um, it seems like a kind of very rich topic, you know, beyond this very rich topic of, uh, of simulations. Yeah, one thing that I follow very actively, the uh, idea of, and the very lively and contentious debates around contact tracking apps and their potential role in uh, fighting the virus or, or mitigating the spread of a virus. Uh, these debates are, are being um, led very differently uh, depending on which country or which area um, in the world you look at. Uh, people in, in European countries have different expectations and values from uh, people in various Asian countries or in the United States. Um, it's not just uh, different technical models that are competing for our uh, attention here, but also um, different values in terms of uh, the protection of privacy or policies about data retention. Um, so it, it has far-reaching consequences for our trust in institutions, whether they're public institutions like governments um, or, or health organizations or private institutions like um, technology companies that might offer such uh, tracking apps. And uh, it also has consequences for mobile communication infrastructure in general. And this is, by the way, something that people in game studies have been looking at uh, for quite a while because a lot of mobile games are already relying on uh, ways to track and trace the activity of mobile devices and sometimes use those for playful, for ludic uh, ends, but also use them for advertising and for monetizing. So uh, we've been studying this closely for a while and it's part of our research and teaching. Um, I don't think there's gonna be an easy answer. Um, uh, of course, the problem with that is that tracking apps are more meaningful if more people use them. They're not they're gonna be very helpful if very few people opt in. They're not gonna be helpful if people have a lack of trust in, in what they can do. Um, and if different countries that share a border have different apps, um, you lose track of people the moment they uh, potentially cross borders or, or, or cross over into a different network. So the both technical and philosophical aspects of it that I find really fascinating. So that's, I mean, that's a really interesting point of just the way in which the pandemic virus, uh, the pandemic uh, situation has revealed all of these kinds of differences and divergences, you know, between urban and rural, between, you know, different kind of national contexts at the U.S., even, you know, in state and, and regional contexts of, you know, conceptions that may not be particularly um, explicitly articulated, but nevertheless are, are, are motivating people in particular ways about their sense of freedom, obedience, mm -hmm. privacy, responsibility, and it traverses the whole range, not just, not obviously not just the question of apps and the digital sphere, but, you know, kind of in the whole range in which we, we exercise. I, I find the, you know, the research that we're pointing to be an important contribution to what's going to definitely be an ongoing and very, uh, very topical discussion. Uh, exactly. Straight from the headlines, but uh, suffused in the history of uh, things that humanities care most about. Well, thank you so much, uh, Peter, for your, for your time and for sharing your expertise with us. And for those of you who are watching, um, I want to thank you all. And we will see you in our next episode of COVID-19, the humanities respond. Thank you, Peter. Thank you.